So our first speaker is very distinguished, Kim Fleischer Michaelsen from Denmark. Kim's going to speak on the effects of breastfeeding and complementary feeding on growth. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will talk about the short-term effects and then afterwards you will hear about the long-term effects. I will also talk quite a lot about IDF1 and the how nutrition can influence IDF1 and thereby growth and also influence insulin. And we have different phases of, uh, of growth like Carl Bird have, have outlined here that the infancy seems to be especially sensitive to nutrition. Later on during childhood it's more growth hormone and then you have the uh, sex hormones during the uh, puberty part. First a little about breastfeeding and growth. There are quite a lot of data saying that uh, breastfed infants have a, a different growth pattern from infants that are formula fed. This is one of the study where they compiled data from many countries of infants who were breast exclusively breastfed for four to six months and then continued breastfed up to 12 months. And when they compare that to the old WHO reference, which is based on the US infants from the 50s to 60s with very low rates of breastfeeding, there was a marked difference with higher growth for the first few months and then a lower growth velocity later on. So based on that, the WHO decided to make a new growth standard, which is the 2006 growth standard. They based it on infants that were uh, breastfed according to the recommendation. As I just said, there should be no health, environmental or economic constraints on growth. And that's important because they also uh, included some low-income countries. So it's not the poor segments of that, those countries. They should be term single with lack of significant perinatal mortality and the mother should not smoke. These are the six sites around the world where uh, infants were followed longitudinally for two years and then there's a cross-sectional part from two to five years. And these are the WHO new standards which you can find on the website. This is the length and the body mass index. You have a disjunction at two years because after that the children were standing up when being measured. Now it's adopted in uh, 126 countries around the world, so it's, it's going to be a global growth reference. So we have a common yardstick to uh, look at our, the growth of our infants. This is just one example on comparison with old ones. This is the center of disease control growth uh, curves. Uh, compared to the new that they use in the US where you can see especially from the last half of infancy there is a very big difference in growth velocity. The breastfed infants are growing slower and that's regarded as the optimal pattern. Then back to IDF1. Many studies show that IDF1 is considerably lower when you are breastfed compared when you are formula fed. Um, and I'll give you some data from one of our cohort studies. It's an observational cohort of 300 healthy infants. We w did it to understand better the mechanism of early obesity development. They were examined 9, 18 and 36 months with blood samples, urine and stool sampling for metabolomics and, and um, microbiota, uh, dietary record, DEXA scans at three years, and seven-day physical activity. And here you have data from that cohort on IDF1. So this is at nine months, well into the complementary feeding period. Um, there is a quite strong effect of breastfeeding, and the more times you were breastfed, the lower IDF1 you have, uh, which is in um, accord with the, the slower growth rate. If we look at fasting insulin, we have the same dose response effects. So insulin, an anabolic hormone, also involved in growth, is also influenced markedly by breastfeeding at this age. When we looked at this uh, cohort and divided them crudely into those that were still breastfed at nine months and those that were not breastfed at nine months, you had for height the standard deviation scores, uh, here we have the arrow. 
that are quite close to the WHO reference, but those that are breastfed less have higher values, significantly higher. If you look at body mass index, you are closer, not exactly on the WHO reference, and the breastfed are for the two first measurements quite above and significantly above. This is from our cohort, the fattest and the thinnest of the babies. So still within these healthy infants, there were quite a lot of variation. We looked at IDF1 and growth from zero to nine months and found a negative association with birth weight and length, meaning that there's a kind of a catch up or adaptation uh, that you get a higher IDF1 if you have a low birth weight, which helps you catch up. Uh, but you also find a positive association between, between change in C-scores uh, from birth to nine months, which is seen in many studies that growth during infancy is positively associated with IDF1 values. Then we looked at the values at nine months and what happened during the following uh, nine months. And if you look at length, as expected, there is an association. If you have high IDF1, you grow at a higher rate in linear growth, but not a significant association with weight. And because of that, you have a negative significant association with body mass index C-scores. And that surprised us a bit because there's a lot of studies saying high IDF1, IDF1 will give obesity later on. But our interpretation of the result is that when they have an acceleration linear growth and are going down in body mass index, they are likely to reach the adiposity rebound at an earlier stage. And thereby, you might have an acceleration of tempo of growth. So these infants are going down earlier and then they might go up uh, quicker. Uh, as shown in an old study from Roland Cassiera, who also looked at protein intake uh, early in life. So if you are fat, you, re you reach the uh, adiposity rebound earlier than if you are thin. If you're a pediatrician, you might be a little worried that linear growth, high, which is quality growth that is lower in breastfed infants, but there are several studies suggesting a, a catch-up, that the breastfed infants are catching up later on. This is from the Alsbach cohort, um, where they measured IDF1 at seven to eight years. And here you had higher, if you were breastfed, you had higher IDF1 levels. In, in, uh, so opposite to what you see during breastfeeding. So it seems like there's a programming which is also supported by a study from the old boy or co cohort uh, where those that were breastfed as adults, they were taller. We had a cohort where we measured IDF1 at nine months at, at 17 years, and we found a negative association between these values. Again, supporting that there is a, a catch up, there's a programming early on of the IDF1 axis. And Richard Martin have in several papers suggested that this uh, association between breastfeeding and insulin-like growth factors could be part of the explanation for the effects of breastfeeding on chronic adult disease. It's still speculative, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Then a little more about protein and IDF1. The question is, if this early programming of the IDF1 axis, is it only caused by the low content of uh, protein in breast milk, or is there also hormonal factors involved, or is it a combination? We don't know for sure. Bert Koletsko have uh, been in charge of a large multinational study, uh, EU funded, in which he looked at randomized children early after delivery to high or low um, uh, protein formula. And when he looked at IDF1 at six months, those that had a high had the protein formula had the highest, those with the lower had a medium, and those with breastfed had the lowest. And in that study he also had a measure on insulin secretion and showed the same dose response pattern. So 
this was data at six months from his study where they randomized children and found that the low pro to the two infant formulas and if they those that were getting a low protein diet or formula they had slower growth rates so closer to the breastfed infants and at two years a lower body mass index so even if the um, intervention only lasted for one year also at two year there were significant differences um, both for weight for length and for body mass index here. Uh, a question that I'll come back to is body mass, uh, body composition, how does that um, influence these associations? They also looked at um, IDF1 at six months in relation to, to gender and found that the the girls had higher values that's seen in many studies so despite they have a grow uh, a slower growth uh, velocity they have higher rates but also that they were better responding to the high protein they had a higher response to it so there's a different regulation between these a little about complementary feeding if you look at data anthropometric data from low-income countries um, and compare them to the new WHO growth standard you have a pattern like this where you have a marked decrease in linear growth up to about two years and then no further decrease and also if you look at uh, weight for length um, or thinness there it's especially during the first part that there is a problem um, in these countries so people have talked about the window of opportunity from minus nine months from conception to 24 months which is a thousand days and that has been used uh, to promote the importance of early nutrition also if you look at, at uh, data on malnutrition here from Niger in, in West Africa you can see that the, you have marked increases in stunting and underweight and some in wasting especially during the first one to one and a half year and after that there's no further increase so we have a window of opportunity and that has been used in, in, in several campaigns and here you have Hillary Clinton saying that we believe that improving nutrition for pregnant women and children under two is one of the smartest investments we or anyone can make so we are in our research supported by Hillary these are growth data from a one and a half year old uh, girl referred to our uh, department for failure to thrive we found out that she had a low fat diet with rice milk and almost no meat and if you can see the reference both in length and in um, and in, in in weight she is falling off up to one and a half year and then she talked to dietitian and the the suggestion was 400 milliliter full fat fat milk and rapeseed oil and after that she had a reasonable catch up going back to the normal values the same growth pattern was seen among dutch children on a macrobiotic diet in the 70s in holland um, that they were falling off even before the age of one year considerably when they were on this diet both in weight and length and the most likely reason is that they have very low intake of animal foods they had low energy density high intake of fibers and high intake of anti-nutrients which is the same that we see in many uh, developing countries in, in low-income countries where you have drought and have problems with moderate and severe malnutrition a little about protein and cow's milk when you go through the complementary feeding you go from a very low protein uh, content in breast milk which is only five energy percent uh, to a family food which is 15 to 20 for comparison whole cow's milk have 20 so that's four times as much protein as in, in cow's milk and in, 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 in breast milk and skimmed milk of course the percentage becomes much higher if you take off the fat and that is up to 39 percent so if you give a lot of skimmed milk you might end up giving a, a very high percent uh, a very high, high amount of, of protein which have negative effects 
Um, we have some studies also in Danish and Italian uh, saying that the 95% is up to 6 to 7 grams per kilo. So it's 6 to 7 times what you need. The high protein intake is related also to later uh, non-communicable diseases and uh, obesity, but we'll hear, hear about that in the next talk, and I will talk about the immediate effects on growth. Cow's milk and linear growth, we made some years ago a review where we looked at data both from industrialized and developing countries. And our conclusion was that the strongest evidence that cow's milk stimulates linear growth come from observational intervention studies in developing countries, but there are also many observational studies from well-nourished population that show an association between milk intake and growth. These results suggest that milk has a growth stimulating effect even in situations where the nutrient intake is adequate, that there's an extra stimulation by uh, most likely dairy protein. We made a cross-sectional study in two and a half year old children and found a significant uh, association between intake of milk and height, which surprised us a bit in healthy random sample of Danish children. And we also found a asso significant association between intake of milk and IDF1 values. So the conceptual framework is that the cow's milk will stimulate IDF, IDF1, but also insulin, and some studies suggest that it's mainly casein for IDF1 and whey for insulin, um, and that there might be a negative feedback on the growth hormone axis as well. So what is it in milk that is so effective? It's the high protein content and quality, but it could also be bioactive peptides, specific amino acids that has growth and hormonal effects. It contains a lot of minerals important for growth. It has a high lactose content, which could have positive effects, no fibers and anti-nutrients. So what can we say about fat intake and growth then? Uh, this was protein. Um, if you get a very low fat diet, the energy density will be very low and that means that your diet will be bulky and if it becomes too bulky, the infant will not be able to eat enough even if it's given at libitum. And there are a few reviews where it's suggested that you should not go below 20 to 25 fat energy percent. If you do that, you will have a problem. And that is what we see in many uh, developing countries where you have uh, children during the complementary feeding periods on uh, a diet with no animal foods and with low fats, mainly based on cereals. And there you might have a problem that can cause uh, poor growth. What about giving a lot of fats? It seems like there's no major, uh, at least in population studies, there are no major effects on growth and, and fat content of the uh, diet, if you measure it as fat energy percent, meaning that the children seem to be able to regulate their energy uh, needs. Uh, so if you put more fat, they eat less and it doesn't seem. Of course, fats together with sugar is a kind of empty calories and, and you might get a more uh, narrow diet, not so diverse if you add too much fat and too much sugar. And I'll finish off by talking about body composition, uh, which is an important aspect that has not been done so much in, in this age group because it's difficult to measure. We are having a collaboration with the University of Dima uh, in Ethiopia for several years and we have a cohort there that we have uh, examined in a pea pot, uh, which is a, a way of measuring body composition. It's air uh, displacement platysmography um, and we have then examined 350 in, in these days I'll show you, but up to 600 children we are now that we followed for the first six months. After six months you can't measure them more because they get too big for this instrument and we now have a bot pot so when they are a few years we can continue the body composition data. And on the screen you get these data on fat percent and percent fat-free mass. Um, 
And these are data on the fat free mass growth from birth to six months. They gain from a little less than three kilos as a mean up to about five kilos which is not surprising, but what is more um, pronounced is a, a difference in, with the sexes, more fat-free mass in the boys, which is not surprising either. Um, but if you look at fat, there are uh, a very strong uh, increase. So you will go from the median of 250 grams fat when they are born up to 2 kg at uh, the age of six months. So you have an eight times increase, uh, but also a huge variation. Some of them will only have half a kilo of, of fat when they are six months, and some will have three kilos of fat. This is not a malnourished population in, in, in Ethiopia. It's, it's a, a, a township uh, population with some malnutrition, but not very much. And this is uh, a pretty complicated plot, but I'll try to pull you through it. You have a lean mass index. So this is like the part of body mass index, which is lean mass, and here you have fat mass index. Here you have body mass index lines, 12, 14, and here you have percentage fat uh, in the body, 30, 20, and 10. And if we first look at the highest turtile uh, with weight gain, with the highest turtile weight gain from zero to six months, those that were growing at a high rate, so these are the, the three turtiles, they were having almost the same fat mass index, not a big difference, but a large difference in lean mass index. So those with the lowest were gaining, they were catching up a lot, and they were actually having more, a higher lean mass index at six months than the others. When you then compare them to those with the lowest turtile, they were having more lean mass here, they were increasing it somewhere, somewhat, uh, and not getting uh, so much fat and, as the others did. I was supposed to talk about diet and, and, uh, and growth. All these infants were uh, breastfed throughout the period. There were, uh, they were introduced at different stages, but there were no major effect of, of diet on this one. Uh, but I'm sure later on during the complementary feeding period there will be much more. So in conclusion, Breastfeeding has a marked effect on growth with a lower weight, length, and body mass index during the first years of life. So I'm looking at the short-term effects. The mechanism is most likely through lower protein, reducing IDF1 and insulin levels. There seems to be a programming of the IDF1 axis with a later catch-up on IDF1 and linear growth. Um, in complementary feeding, a very low content of animal foods, as seen in many low-income countries, has a negative effect on growth. High intake of animal protein, especially cow's milk, stimulate linear growth and increase body mass index. And the amount of fat in the diet does not seem to have an effect on growth if it's not very, large, very low, sorry, below 20 to 25 energy percents. I think there's a lot more we need to know of this very interesting period. Uh, we need to know about the mechanisms behind early uh, diet, growth and risk of diseases later in life to better understand the mechanism and also what we can do, which interventions will work. We need to look at diet, appetite, hormones, hormonal regulation of growth, growth of course, and then body composition to completely understand what is happening during this sensitive window of opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs>